Well, welcome to the RU Recovery Program here at South Haven Baptist Church in Springfield, Tennessee. We're excited that you joined in this evening. We're looking forward to a, just a wonderful class. I've really enjoyed over the last several weeks having a lot of different guests with us and, and uh, looking forward to tonight's guest, the evangelist Dr. Dave Smith. And he did not want me to call him any of those names. He wanted me just to call him Brother Smith. But I am just thrilled tonight to have you with us as our guest. Good to be here. And, uh, of course, Brother Smith and his wife joined South Haven Baptist Church in September of 2018. Right. All the way from Long Beach, California. Because of the weather. Because of the weather. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to find a good church. And so he just said, we'll go as far as we can till we find a great church. And we're so thankful that you're here. As soon as they got here, as soon as they joined, they got involved and uh, moved to the area. And we're just thrilled to have him with us tonight. And uh, truly, it's been a joy to get to know uh, Brother Smith. I almost called you the evangelist doctor again. (laughs) But it's been a joy to get to know Brother Smith and... Uh, this past year, he actually preached, was our special guest preacher at our RU Christmas party, did, a, did an incredible job and, and many decisions made that night. Uh, we had well over 100 people in attendance and just had a wonderful time. And uh, then also, in my absence, several times he's filled in and, and done such a great job. They said, we want Dr. Smith. We want. And uh, no, but I'm teasing. But he has done a tremendous job, always willing to help, always willing to serve. Brother Smith, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good. How's the wife? She is doing great. Okay. Uh, yeah. We've been praying for her health, and sure. she's stabilized and kept from the sure. coronavirus, so that's good. Amen. Amen. Anything exciting going on? Anything you want to share? Maybe some excitement going on in your life lately? Hey, we had one meeting canceled, and I just heard in Milwaukee this month we're going to be going with it. So that's Amen. Good Amen. Milwaukee, where it's nice and much colder now, so... You know, the weather has changed here over the last few hours. I think it dropped 10 degrees from this morning to uh, tonight. And so, global warming. Global warming. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I tell you what, uh, we like to start off with praises. We had three segments of time. We call it Talk, Talk, Talk. And I know you're familiar with the RU Recovery Program. None of this is new to you. But we start off with praises and testimonies. We like to brag on God. And so we've got some praises tonight. We'll go over those. We have a challenge group, a discipleship program where we work on our challenges together, but it also gives us an opportunity to sit in with someone. Over the past week, I've had three men that have contacted the helpline, and they're looking for what they call a sponsor, and I explained the importance of having that quote-unquote sponsor that this particular uh, meeting that this gentleman, this one gentleman was was going to. I said, listen, it's really an accountability partner. Mm. It's placing yourself under the authority of the scripture and the word of God but also finding another man or or the ladies with the ladies and having another lady or another man come alongside them and take the word of God and disciple them. And that's a wonderful time. But then we come back into the auditorium on a normal Friday night, and I'm looking forward to being back together real soon. On a normal Friday night, and we have the third talk, which is God's truth speaking to us. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Brother Smith will be bringing that here in just a few moments, so you stay tuned. Do you have any praises? Anything great going on in your life? Well, you know, I was praying for, in ministry-wise, we were praying for uh, meetings. Mm -hmm. And the morning I was praying, you called and invited me. I got the confirmation about Milwaukee, and I was able to do a little Zooming up in Pennsylvania for a church service up there. So a little different during this this, uh, time of of downplay. But sure, uh, sure. Yeah, good. Praise the Lord. God's good. Amen. All the time. And tonight's theme, I like to have a theme, just something we can sort of stand on and begin to uh, gear our hearts, if you will, and our minds towards it. And that's the thought of revival tonight. Yes, sir. And uh, we'll talk about that here shortly. And I look forward to hearing from Dr. Smith, the evangelist, my brother (laughs) in Christ, Brother Smith. I do have some praises. First off, do you know what's going on this Sunday? Do you know what special day it is for all, starts with the letter M, well, it might be Mother's Day. Mother's Day. The we like the second to... most important day of the year. <laughs> second most. What's the first? Father's Day. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's great. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all moms out there tonight, to my mother, to my wife, and uh, the same for Dr. Smith and his dear wife and family. And so uh, we want my moms up there. Oh, uh, moms in heaven. <laughs> and uh, we are just so thankful for mothers tonight. And I, I, I like to back up what someone else said. I wouldn't be here without you, Mom, you know. And I don't, anyway, I know that was stupid. Uh, we also praise the Lord tonight for our pastor and just his continued leadership. 
and uh, guidance. And, and I know you've been through, uh, you've been in ministry for well over 40 years now, and, and you were a senior pastor for about 30 years, 30 plus years. And so you've been there, you've done that, you got the t-shirt, you know. But our pastor has really had to make some difficult decisions. Yeah. And uh, we're looking forward to, hopefully within the next week, um, maybe by next weekend, we'll be able to have our first service really? in the auditorium. Of course, there's a lot of uh, criteria and things that we have to follow. And so, but we do praise the Lord for our pastor and for his example and his leadership. Thank you so much, Pastor, again, for your devotions daily. I've been a very, very great encouragement to me. And then praise the Lord for all the medical workers and uh, those that get up every day and, mm -hmm. and go to work and, and uh, put themselves right there in the front lines. Sure and uh, put themselves out there and the opportunity that they could also contract uh, the virus and the different things that are going on. And then I wanted to add a praise tonight, which is, uh, which is I want to praise the Lord for the electrical workers, for all the wiremen, the guys who are going up on the lifts and climbing up those poles. Did you lose your electricity? I did a couple of days ago. Uh, we've had a lot of storms here in the great state of Tennessee lately. <laughs> and uh, in Nashville alone now, they had over 130,000 homes mm -hmm. uh, that were without power. And uh, I believe so, they said it may still be another week or so before. 40,000 still. Left. Yes, sir. 40,000 still without power. And so we praise the Lord for you tonight, electrical workers. And then also just want to share some verses with you. I love sharing verses, okay? And in the book of Psalms, chapter number 46, familiar verses, mm -hmm. uh, beginning at verse 10, the Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. We've had a lot of time for that. We've had a lot of time to be still. <laughs> And uh, in, in all honesty, I will, the Bible says, I will be exalted among the heathen. And we have that wonderful time right now in our lives personally as Christians tonight to exalt the Lord, to be still, and uh, to meditate upon the Lord, and to pause, if you will. And then also, uh, reading on in verse 11, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then he says, Selah. Again, that's another opportunity to pause think on that. and to meditate and to think about what the Lord's doing during this time. We love you. We miss every one of you. We're excited, looking forward to getting back together again real soon. Those are some praises. You may have some praises tonight. Feel free to reach out, text me, call me, 615-543-5703, and we would be happy to add your requests, your praises, your prayer requests uh, to what we have going on and over the next couple of days, and I'm looking forward to being back together. I really am. And uh, But hey, we got some prayer requests that came in, yes, sir. and I know that you have some that you want to share tonight. Let me share these quickly, and then I'll turn it over to Brother Smith. Please continue praying for all the RU family, our leadership, our RU students. Uh, it's been real easy to uh, spend some time apart during this time and sort of get accustomed, if you will, to not meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I truly believe, I, I know a lot of people are, st are talking in the negative way, but I truly believe when we get back together, people are going to be starving and right. excited I think we to, get, to get back together. I know our church folks are, and, and I pray for you tonight, those that are involved in the RU program, that you'll look forward to being back together again real soon, and that's something to look forward to. And then pray again. Pray this Sunday's uh, service. Our pastor will be bringing a wonderful message. Continue to pray for him and, and pray for those in the special music. Pray for our storm victims. I mentioned a moment ago the power outages and other things. Many have experienced damage to their home, trees right. falling down and, and uh, mm -hmm. barns blown over. Trees on them. Trees on them. And, yeah. and so continue to pray for the storm victims, also those that have been injured. And then one more I wanted to add is continue to pray for those that are being diagnosed uh, with the virus and pray for their families. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many have lost loved ones and friends. And so please continue to pray for them and and to lift their names up tonight and lift them up to the Lord. And then I believe you have some prayer requests tonight do, as well. I do, Brother Johnny. Uh, pray for our law enforcement. You mentioned yeah. first responders. Sure. So I want to pray for those. Thank God for, for those people. Yeah. You know, we live in a day when a lot of times there's a lack of, lack of appreciation, respect yeah. for those people. But they do yeah. put their lives on the line. We want to pray for them. Yes, sir. Pray for those who have been without jobs for the last several weeks. What a stress that can be. Yeah. And uh, we know that uh, there are many. Yeah. that are, are insecure about what the future holds sure. as well as presently and the Amen. needs that they have struggling financially, yes, sir. emotionally. So I'll pray for them. And then, of course, Governor Lee, thank the Lord he's a Christian. He Amen. Knows the Lord is his Savior. Amen. Thank and, you, Lord. Uh, but we all pray for him anyway, and we do. Sure. And pray for, of course, President Trump. Yes, sir. And we pray for him every day. 
The Bible says that uh, as the rivers are turned, uh, God can turn these men. Amen. And he needs wisdom. Amen. Actually, he's been going at it Amen. for quite a few weeks. And, yeah. and uh, appreciate him and pray for wisdom there. Sure. And he's got a lot of opposition as well. Yeah. So many decisions yet to be made. They need sure. God's wisdom. And, yes, sir. And uh, let's pray for them. Yes, sir. As well as Tim Sloan. Me too. Uh, pray for prayer for his mother, Erlene. Yeah. I believe she's in a rest home. She is, yes, and, sir. And uh, so we want to be praying for her. Yes, lady. sir. And then I had some other requests. Continue to pray, like we said earlier. We're praising the Lord for our hospital workers, but we're also praying for them, uh, that, that God will give them strength to do their job. And uh, many of them, this is their calling. This is their ministry, is to minister us physically and, and pray for those that are working long hours, many, many long hours. And uh, continue to pray for the RU Rockford okay. uh, staff and leadership and Pastor Kingsbury, Brother Burks. Continue to pray for them. We're so thankful uh, for RU tonight and for uh, just the changes it's made in my life personally. Mm. And uh, uh, people say, well, I don't know that I need that RU program. I don't know that I don't really have any addictions. I don't really have any strongholds. And I tell you, it's one of the greatest discipleship programs I've ever been involved in. Right. And uh, I need the program, and I'm so thankful for the leadership. Pray for a cure. Continue to pray for a cure. You know, there's a lot of folks working on it. There's a lot of scientists and others that are working, and uh, I believe we're real close and uh, looking forward to the day when we get the news that we have a cure, we have a vaccine. And then continue to pray that souls will be saved during this time. Sure. Many people are afraid and fearful, and you mentioned earlier uh, they're a little uneasy and, and uh, insecure, if you right. will, right. Uh, with some things going on in their life, and pray that God would be glorified during this time. And and I think that's all we had come in tonight. Dr. Smith, would you mind, Brother Smith, <laughs> would you mind praying for us tonight on this quest? Thank Let's you. pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you and thanking you yes. for the praises that we have, even that were shared here this evening. Uh, you said that when we come into uh, your throne and into the, at the throne of grace, that we're to come with thanksgiving, yes. letting our requests be made known unto you. And Lord, we, we don't want to be... Uh, remiss about forgetting all of your many benefits, Psalm 103 says, uh, the benefits that you have given to us. Lord, we're saved. We're thankful for salvation. We're thankful our sins have been forgiven. We're thankful, Lord, that you're with us in the storms. Yes. We've been mentioning tonight, and all of us are immersed, all of us, and even around the world mm -hmm. in this uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. And Lord, we thank you that even in these kinds of times, with all the dimensions of the various things that are going on, the results of it, we thank you that you're with us in those Amen. storms. Amen. Thank you that you stand with us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who indwells us as believers. And Lord, we're thankful for a God who loves us and cares for us and is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, yes. yet without sin. Amen. So Lord, we praise you tonight. We want to thank you for uh, the RU family. Thank you for those that are watching and looking in tonight. And Amen. We pray that uh, this uh, video, this live stream will be, a, a, at least a streaming, will be a, a blessing to them, mm. an encouragement. May they uh, be edified and, yes. and even corrected if uh, the Holy Spirit so desires. Yes. We pray, Lord, for uh, our you students that uh, uh, victory, liberty, and, and freedom might be found in, in, in our Lord. We pray for leadership. Thank you, Lord, for Brother Johnny, all the workers that assist him every week. Thank you for the faithfulness and the, the power of your word to work and change lives. Amen. Amen. And uh, we're grateful for that, Heavenly yes. Father. Thank you, so we give to you the RU program and pray that it continue to increase. Would you prosper it and would you give success? Yes. And then uh, for the service this coming Sunday, here just another Another day and, and uh, another live stream service. We pray that you'd bless the music. We pray that you would bless our pastor. Yes. Anoint him and Lord, give him just the words and the message that he needs from your word to uh, us. And we thank you that we have a good under shepherd that loves us and walks Amen. with you and, and gives us faithfully the word of God. So we pray, Lord, your blessing upon that. And then for the many that have gone through the, the storms of our area, uh, Lord, uh, not only the uh, tornado a few weeks back and mm -hmm. the results of that and damage that was done, lives that were lost, but even this past week of yeah. another storm and, and uh, damage and, and uh, the you know, loss of power and the 
thousands that have been without electricity. Uh, we just pray that you would uh, uh, help us to realize that, again, you're with us yes. through the storms. When Amen. thou passest through the, the, the waters, you will be with us. Amen. So with the Lord, thank you that we are passing through and, and we're going to get through this. So, mm. Lord, we pray for those that have been diagnosed with this horrible virus. Many have passed and then families bereaved and, and they're sorrowful and, and saddened because of the experience. And some are in hospitals yeah. all over America, around the world. And uh, pray, Lord, that you'd use this to turn ourselves to you. Uh, God, we always don't understand things, but we know that life is hard. Amen. Life is a struggle. Amen. But we thank you that we have you as our refuge as our high tower. We pray, Lord, for law enforcement. Thank you for those men and women who uh, protect us, who enforce laws and uh, keep law and order. We thank you, Father, for them. Protect them. Uh, they are putting their lives on the line. And in this day and age, we find that uh, many would not even want to have this vocation because of the danger that's associated with it. Yes. Protect them and uh, bless them, we pray. Yes. Lord, I pray that you bless their families, comfort them. And then those that are without work. Mm. Lord, uh, you know that we need work to, yes. to support our families. You've ordained that. And we pray that you give those that are working with our economy, those that are working with uh, uh, working to get the economy going again, opening up businesses and, and work, and those that are not even sure that they have a job. Mm -hmm. Lord, would you just... Uh, uh, encourage them. Thank you for our own church family. Whoever may be uh, uh, experiencing uh, whether their businesses or their employers or employees, we pray that you would provide for them work yes. and a recovery from what we've been going through. Amen. We pray that you give them a peace to know that uh, you're going to work all things together for good because we love God and are called according to your purpose. We pray for those in authority. We pray for our governor. We pray for our president. We pray for our, uh, the vice president and his cabinet yes, and amen. Congress and all the chaos and the conspiracy thoughts and confusion that uh, reigns uh, at least on the federal level and even in the state mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. God, we pray that you will use all of this yes. to realize that the answer is not politics. The answer mm -hmm. is, is our Lord. Uh, the answer is the gospel and holiness and righteousness. Oh well, Lord, we pray that you give these leaders wisdom and use them as you mm -hmm. see fit. For Tim and his mother, we pray that you'd, uh, uh, your Bible, Bible says that you're the healer of all diseases. Yeah. The great physician, touch her body, Erlene's body, and pray that you'd raise her up, give her strength Amen. today for accomplishing the will of God for her life. For all these other requests, Lord, yes. we, we thank you that you are a God who knows and, and uh, is caring for all things. Lord, our, our uh, responsibility is to pray and to rest Amen. and to cast our care upon you because Amen. you care for us. We thank Amen. you for that. And we'll praise you in ahead of time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Brother Smith. Yes, sir. That was wonderful. You know, I've uh, all the time I've been able to spend with my family and, and also with friends, <clears throat> Uh, just during this time of downtime, if you will, one of the main things God's been doing in my heart is this area of revival. And uh, he's wanting to work in my heart. Mm. You know, he's wanting to work in me personally. Sure. And I don't want to just continue doing the same thing yeah. and having the same results. But I want to see God move in such a way in our ministry, uh, not just our you, but also in our church sure. and in our community. But one thing that God's definitely teaching me personally is I'm in control of nothing. <laughs> I mean, I truly am not. I mean, God uh, controls it all. He took a virus, a simple virus, if you will. Right. right. Something that many, as it began to spread around, our, uh, around the world, many began to say and compare it to colds and the flu and, and a stomach bug. Well, we found out very quickly uh, that it was more serious than that. And uh, it's just an opportunity to really spend... Mm -hmm that time alone with the Lord. And I wanted to ask you, of course, you've been in ministry many, many years, and you're still serving the Lord. Uh, you don't look a day over 50. It's amazing <laughs> I'm still alive. Thank you. I appreciate it. And again, I asked you earlier how your dear wife was doing, and, and I know being in the ministry, uh, I'm so blessed and honored to be 
on staff here at South Haven and be the director of the RU program. But I could not be in ministry if I did not have my wife there hmm. to support me, to sure. encourage me, to serve together. And that's why I was asking you how she was doing and, mm -hmm. and different things going on in her life. Continue to pray for her and her health. And uh, then also, just over there, I told you just briefly kind of what God's been doing in my life, uh, in my heart personally. Um, what has God been teaching you? What has God been showing you during all the downtime? You know, Brother Johnny, I've been reading uh, from Psalms mm -hmm. uh, for my personal time with the Lord and working my way through the Psalms. And I've been uh, interested to see that uh, in at least three of the Psalms that I was in right there in the nestle in the 80s and 90, 90s Psalms, there, uh, there's one phrase that is repeated over again, and it says, the Lord reigneth. Amen. The Lord reign it. It says that three, at least begins three different psalms that I can recall right now. And uh, that's, that's the truth Amen. That, uh, that you just referred to, that God is sovereign. Yeah. Uh, no matter what is going on, we don't understand all the where's and what's and why's and wherefore's mm -hmm. of, the, of the virus and sure. all of these things, uh, our economy. Mm -hmm. But God's in control. Amen. God's in control. So yes, that, that's the great truth that Amen. comes to me. Well, give us an update, if you would. Just I know you said a lot of your meetings have been canceled, but you just found out recently this week that you will be going to the great uh, community of Milwaukee <laughs> and a wonderful place there in the north. My wife uh, made that famous. I don't and know your if wife? <laughs> she was born there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know where you I were going with that. But that's, uh, <laughs> I did not know. I just uh, I know it's a place of cheese and, and other uh, things, yes, Jersey cows, things. Holsteins. Uh, so thankful for the dairy. <laughs> But how, how are things going with your ministry as far as uh, your evangelist, uh, evangelistic okay. work, as far as missions? Sure. Yeah, we're appreciating the fact that uh, we've got projects going on right mm -hmm. now as far as world evangelism. Yes, sir. Uh, just hearing today about uh, nationals that uh, are in India mm -hmm. that are, are there's 1.3 billion people in India. Wow. And uh, Hinduism is the main one. Mm -hmm. Muslims, Islam is the second main mm -hmm. The gospel is so needful. There's mm -hmm. 1,200 people groups in India wow. that are without the gospel. They have not, have not a Bible. So uh, we're grateful for the national pastors that are Amen. being trained there. Amen. And the work's going forward there, and there's encouragement there. There's uh, Mongolian Old Testament that's being translated. They'll have the whole Bible here before the year's end, we hope. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of different projects that are going on. We're Amen. grateful for that and, and for us. Uh, we're grateful for every revival, every missions yes. conference Amen. that comes our way. And I look forward to two, 2020 in yes, regards sir. to the way it started off. We were, just got back on, in February when the Wuhan virus was just coming out. Yes, sir. So uh, it was there in Seoul when I was there and Cebu, Philippines when I was there. Yeah. We're grateful uh, that we're still healthy and able to serve the Lord. Yes, sir. Amen. Seven weeks of quarantine. I haven't seen you in forever. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but uh, so thankful. Thank you for answering that. And then just, just a couple more things. Sure. Uh, of course, you've grown up in ministry all your life. Uh, your father was a pastor. Yes, sir. And uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what age you were when you were saved. Four and a half. Four and a half. Wow. Yeah. Four and a half years old. Celebrating about 70 years. Amen. This year. <laughs> Like I said, you don't look a day over 50. Thank but, you. Um, <laughs> I'll give you $20. Every, every time I say that, I get 20 bucks. So That's right. we'll just put that right in the R you cut. <laughs> but I just wanted to ask you just uh, sort of a three-part question. Okay. And you just you answered it at liberty how you feel. Um, have you personally, in all the years you've been involved in ministry, have you ever experienced revival, whether it be in a church, a community, a state, mm -hmm. uh, just a small area, a small town? And do you believe that revival is possible? And then thirdly, what do you believe God is doing in the midst, in our midst, okay. and also in the world? Oh, those are great questions, Johnny. Uh, first of all, in regards to uh, your second question, uh, is revival possible? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, David said in Psalm 85, Wilt thou not revive us again, Amen. that thy people may rejoice in thee? Revive us again, that meaning revival, new life, comes sure. again and again. And again and again, that's true personally. Amen. Every one of us can have personal revival. Sure. Uh, R.A. Torrey, uh, years ago in the 
uh, 1900s, early 1900s, said, uh, gave a formula, actually, I don't know if you're familiar with this formula for revival. He said, uh, if you want to have revival, do three things, and revival will come. Amen. One thing is to draw a circle <laughs> and get in it yourself. And like the old uh, black spiritual uh, that uh, uh, they, they used to sing, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need, need of prayer. prayer. So he said, get in the circle and just pray that the revival would begin Amen. in me. I think that's Amen. true for all of us, that sure. we need to just pray, God, begin it in me. Amen. Okay? And then he said, number two, he said, when you're in that circle, he said, be willing to get thoroughly right with God. Hmm. Now, that's where we lose a lot of people. Uh, yeah. There are things that we want to hang on to, sins sure. and things sure. that just, please, Lord, habits. Uh, yeah. uh, just different things that yes. we just hold on to. And he says, no, be, it, revival will come when you're willing mm. to thoroughly sure. get right with God. And then he added, and with others. Mm. And there again, we lose a lot of people because there are a lot of people that are willing to get right with God, but they Amen. think they can get right with God, but have bitterness and, yes. and uh, yes. resentment and yes, anger and wrath against other people. I always say, you can't have a vertical relationship with God without having a horizontal relationship yeah. with others. And that's a cross yes, sir. right there. And uh, so, again, Ari Tori said, be willing to get in the circle, say, Lord, begin the revival in me. Mm. And then number two, be willing to thoroughly get right with God Amen. and others. Number three, he said, pray until revival comes. It'll yeah. come. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and answer your question, you know, yes, revival's possible, mm -hmm. personally. At what level do we begin to branch out? We want mm. revival. We should be praying for revival for our family, sure. for our marriage, Amen. for our wives, our husbands. Uh, we ought to be praying for revival for uh, our church. Mm -hmm. uh, is our church experiencing revival? Yeah. Uh, our city, mm -hmm. Springfield, in this relationship or the areas around us, or so national good. revival. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I could even pray biblically about national revival today in America because mm -hmm. I don't believe it would be even correct. I think yeah. we've gone so far in America, sadly, sure. that we can't say a revival. We need a spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people have called this a post-Christian era, mm -hmm. and that's sad because that's not what we've always known in our yes, country, sir. but a spiritual awakening is certainly necessary, yes, and a worldwide revival. And that goes all within, Brother Johnny, the context of maybe what is God's plan for the ages. Sure. I, you know, I look at you and I have to say, you know, be honest, uh, is, it, is it possible? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Is it going to come? I don't know, because mm. I think, you know, we're looking for Jesus to come. Amen. And uh, it may sure. uh, prevent that. Of course, the Bible says when the rapture occurs and we're gone, there's going to be 144,000 mm. evangelists that are going to be amazing, that are going to see people, groups, and languages, and nations turning mm. to God like we've never seen before. So that... That's another another mm -hmm. uh, subject. You asked if I'd ever seen or experienced revival. Um, I often tell a story that goes back to my father's days uh, in his church in Jackson, Michigan. And I remember it well as a child. I was sitting over on the left-hand side with my mom. I was the only child. And so I didn't have any brothers or sisters. But I remember uh, after every revival, my dad would have a night uh, testimony time. So what decisions did you make, you would say? You know, what, what did God say to you during this revival? Mm. Well, I was a four and a half, five, six-year-old kid. I was kind of used to testimony times in church. It would be, you know, a couple ladies after a little urging mm. that would stand up and say, I'm glad God saves, satisfies, and delivers, or whatever. <laughs> Sit down, and that would be the end of testimony time. But this night was different. Actually, a, a lady stood up, and I said, here we go. But she stood up, and she began crying. And I remember as a little boy, five, six years of age, Jackson, Michigan, Wall Street Baptist Church. I remember this lady began crying. Then she looked across the church uh, congregation and she began to dressing another lady. And she said, uh, I, I want you to know that I, we've not talked for months, wow. maybe years. I can remember what it was, but it wow. was a long time. And she said, I, I know I'm not right with you and I know you're not, you're, you're not happy with me. Mm -hmm. And so I would need to get that right right now. She just got up from her, <laughs> where she was standing. She went all the way across the auditorium, embraced her, and they just began weeping and hugging each Praise other, getting things right with each other. And then uh, I think it was uh, uh, right after that, a man 
started coming down the aisle toward my dad in the pulpit. And you did that today. You'd have ushers or <laughs> us, this fellow's coming down the aisle with cigarettes and wrapped up in his, his sleeve. He takes those out and throws them down in the, on the platform there right next to the pulpit where my dad was standing. He said, God spoke to me this week Amen. about how my body is the body of the uh, uh, of God and, and the Holy Spirit lives within me and Praise that I'm not going to send me to hell, but it makes me sin, smell like I've been there and, sure. and I'm convicted yeah. that I don't want to smoke anymore. I want to glorify God with my body. And, uh, and, and so he made that declaration. Mm-hmm. And I think it was uh, another man stood up. And I remember him because he didn't come to church. He was the father of one of my buddies, mm-hmm. uh, Teddy Strasberg. And this was Ted Strasberg, the father, stood up. His wife came, uh, Virginia Strasberg, came to church with her son, my buddy, Teddy Strasberg. And Ted, uh, the father, was uh, uh, they call him bartender. In those days, he, he worked in a beer garden. That's what mm-hmm. they called it up there. Sure. And uh, he was unsaved. He said, you know, I've been watching people, and I've been watching my wife and watching Amen. my son. Amen. And I'm conv- I need Jesus Christ. And he got saved that <laughs> night. And uh, de- God delivered him, and his life was never the same. Amen. And that just began, Brother Johnny, what I remember, what my parents always called a a, a, a revival mm. of young couples getting saved, people as sure. uh, lives changed, and just a dynamic until Absolutely. we left that church to go to California to plant a church Amen. in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1954. That church was just booming, and, and sure. it was what I would say I've never experienced. But probably uh, those of you who are listening and, mm. and you're hearing me probably have never seen this, yeah. you know, where that dynamic is is just uh, young people sent out to, to full-time Christian service, sure. missions, mission field. Amen. It was just um, unbelievable. Amen. And you just pray, Lord, help that to happen again. And but you, yes, I did re- you know, experience that. And the revivals you're speaking of are individual, personal revivals in the heart of God's people. Oh, absolutely. But that was what I call a church-wide Amen. revival. Amen. You know, we can all have personal revival sure. in regards to what anybody else is doing. But this was a church-wide. Yes, sir. You know, you read read uh, history accounts of Billy Sunday and and uh, R.A. Torrey and Moody and all these were towns, yeah. cities, sure. and states. You know, went through Amen. revivals, but we haven't seen that in over hundred yes, hundred years in America. Yes, sir. Well, I know God is doing something great, and uh, I'm excited to be alive during this Absolutely. generation, Absolutely. at this time in my life, and and I'm so thankful yeah. for the answers that you gave and. Uh, just impactful and encouraging. And you may be watching tonight, you're wondering, uh, Johnny, why? Like, I'm just wondering, why are you talking about revival and an addictions recovery program? Mm -hmm. And uh, just thinking about that this week and and meditating upon it, I wrote some things down because it's it's very uh, important that we understand tonight when God's people get right, when we get a heart and a passion for God's work, for God's ministry. More importantly, like you mentioned a moment ago, what God wants to do in us personally. When we do that, then it's at that time that we begin to have a heart for those around us. Yeah. You know, it's the law of God. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. We'll never love others. We'll never be a soul winner. We'll never enjoy being in the ministry, being a part of the ministry, until we first get back to our first love, right. as the Bible talks about in Revelation. Galatians chapter 6, you know these verses. Brethren, if a, man be taken over, uh, if a man be overtaken in a fall, excuse me, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Listen, considering thyself, mm-hmm. lest thou also be tempted. Right. And there's been a lot of considering going on lately in my own heart, in my own life, in my own mind. And I'm sure that you could say the same in your own life tonight. Just giving a lot of thought to ministry, a lot of thought to my salvation how God got a hold of my life and rescued me out of a life of addiction and and other things. And, uh, you know, he set me upon a rock, (laughs) brought me up out of the miry clay. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so thankful for what he's doing in the RU Recovery Ministry. I'm thankful for the people who have joined in tonight to be a part of it with us. I'm excited about the third talk that you'll bring to us in just a moment. But at this time, we're going to turn it over to Brother Steve Currington. He, of course, is our co-founder of the RU Recovery Program in 1996. He is now with the Lord as of 2010, and tonight he has principle number nine, and this is it. You ready, Brother Smith? We lose our freedom to choose when we give in to temptation, because the consequences are 100% up to God. And so I pray that you'll enjoy it. Get a pen, a 
a piece of paper, a pencil, whatever you have there, get a typewriter, whatever you have, get your phone ready, pull out the Bible, enjoy this principle, write down some things, jot down some memory verses there. And when we come back from the 10 principle video with Brother Steve Currington, Brother Dave Smith will be bringing our third talk tonight, a discipleship lesson, and you don't want to miss it. I know God has something special for you tonight. Been praying for you. I love you. I miss you. And I know we're going to be back together real soon. Please stay in touch. I look forward to seeing you. God bless. Principle number nine says we lose our freedom to choose when we give in to temptation. The consequences for our wrongdoing are inevitable, incalculable, and up to God. A lot of times people think that they can make bad decisions and control the consequences. But the truth is, when you make a bad decision in life and, and, and give in to a selfish or fleshly appetite, the consequences for your wrongdoing are totally 100% up to God. <laughs> you see, you can sense the beginnings of your sin, but you cannot guess at the awful ramifications of it. I remember learning this, this spiritual truth, if you will, when I was a sophomore in high school, 1982, I think it was, there was an NBA draft, and a gentleman was drafted in the NBA by the name of Len Bias, and he was going to be a basketball player for the Boston Celtics. He was one of the biggest stars ever to come out of college there in 1982, and wouldn't you know it, he got drafted number one, and he was the first NBA player to be drafted and paid on draft day a one million dollar contract. I mean that means nothing today but back then that was a lot of money for an athlete and that night he went out and ingested powder cocaine for the very first time in his life and he had a seizure and died. Why? <laughs> because you cannot determine the consequences for your wrongdoing. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> God's watching everything you're doing. And the Bible says, He pondereth, or He considers, all of our goings. The Bible goes on to say, Your own iniquities, your own wrongdoing, shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden. He shall be holden. That's an old English word for being held. He will be held by the cords of his sin. I'd like to use an illustration if I could. Does anybody out there, Brother Dan, why don't you come on up here? I have a little stool set here. Have a seat, brother, would you please? Wow, nice shirt. I love that shirt. Where did you get that? Resale shop. Resale shop. Amen. That's a nice shirt. Well, Dan here is going to play the role of the tempted, and I'm going to play the role of the tempter. You remind me of myself a lot when I was younger. I used to wear shirts like that all the time. And when I wore shirts like that, I had bad problems in my life. I remember when I first started getting out of high school and I began to engage in alcohol. I'd, I'd drink a little bit. And what happened was the, the cords of my sin, they didn't hold me. They didn't bind me. They didn't restrict me. No, I was enjoying myself. There was nothing all that harmful to what I was doing. It seemed as if it had no no real effect on my life. Oh, every once in a while, it would slow my progress. And then after listening to bad music, the music got harder. And after drinking, the, the drinking got harder. And, and then I began to, to uh, uh, smoke dope. And then the, uh, the drugs got harder. And, and, and then I began to hang out with bad people that made things even worse for me. And they taught me how to deal drugs. And next thing you knew, I started losing jobs. And, and, and my, my sins started to control me, but to be honest with you, I mean, I had it all under control. Oh, it hindered me sometimes from doing all the things I want, but I didn't feel as if I was held. They were somewhat loose, but the Bible says that the wicked himself shall be held. He shall be held by the cords of his sin. He will die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. He said, you'll look for advice, you'll look for counsel, but because your folly, because your mistake was so great, you'll die because you went astray and the way you went astray is thinking that there's absolutely no harm in having things that hold you back or having things in your life that hold you down. All oh, the freedom to choose what you're going to do after you've begun this lifestyle is no longer up to Dan or myself. No, it's up to the tempter, the one who holds you with the cords of your sin. And as soon as Dan wants to try to get up and get out, he finds himself held.
wild and he cannot have any forward progress because what once was loose and free is now tight and bound. You'll find yourself absolutely miserable in life. You see, sin is fun for a while, but the results of your sin are never worth it. Proverbs 20, 17 says, Bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. That's like saying it's enjoyable to engage in wrong behavior, but when you're done, you're going to have a bad taste in your mouth. Oh, how true that is. Proverbs 9, 17 says, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. It's enjoyable, but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that our guests are in the depths of hell. And we, people like myself and Dan made the mistakes that we made in life. We had no idea that as we were enjoying the pleasantries of our sin, we had no idea that everybody else that had been there before us experienced a spiritual and sometimes a premature physical death because they had been held by the cords of their sin. No, the consequences for our actions are inevitable incalculable and up to God. God's going to destroy you if you don't live for him. His desire is for these held sins to hold you back till you finally look to the Lord and say, Oh Lord, would you set me free? And you'll find like I did in John 8, 32, that when you, when you know the truth, that the truth, go ahead and stand up, Dan, will make you free. And that's exactly how God does it. He says, stand and walk. And then you can go your way, the way that God has designed for you. But when you make that bad decisions, your freedom to choose is followed by consequences outside of your control. Why? Because principle number nine says we lose our freedom to choose when we give in to temptation. Our consequences are inevitable incalculable and up to God. That's principle number nine. And a good evening to you and appreciate those principles that Brother Currington just gave in regards to, to the Christian life. I want to spend some time with him. First of all, thank you. Uh, Brother Johnny, for the opportunity to be with you uh, here at RU. I love the RU program and appreciated the opportunities I've had in the past to be with you. And uh, so tonight, I'm going to uh, be dealing with something that I think is really key to the Christian life as to whether you're going to be successful or whether you're going to be a failure. Uh, you know, maybe your life is, is just one of, of, of looking at your Christian life and saying, man, I just can't live the Christian life. And I understand that. Uh, none of us can actually. But maybe you see your life as a failure. Maybe you see your life as a, a roller coaster. You're up one day and down the next, up one day and down the next. You see others going forward and you're not going anywhere fast. And I want to just uh, try to help you tonight. With, I think I could give you from the Bible a key to the answer that help you to go forward in your Christian life. One of the things that I've seen in Christians over the years, this is the element, this is the area that I would put my finger on as to saying the difference between those going forward and those going backward is what we find in the scripture. So I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles to turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 in the New Testament. As you're finding your place there, we're going to look at the first chapter and the first seven verses. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 7 verses. And we read these words. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. 
Why don't you listen to that word virtue? We're going to hear it one more time. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. I may have just add that last uh, phrase of verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us tonight these few moments together to be a blessing to every member of RU, visitors and guests alike, that we might be benefited from the precious and powerful Word of God. Deliver us and help us to know what the Christian life is all about tonight. Help me as I speak. Fill me with your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to deal with this passage tonight. The text is 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5. And look at that verse there. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to your faith. And uh, we're going to consider tonight adding to your faith virtue. Uh, we would have, if we had more time, we could spend weeks on this passage. But I want to just uh, spend with you these few moments tonight about faith plus virtue. Faith plus virtue. May I say, to begin with, that I, by way of introduction, I believe three things. Three different things. Number one is faith plus nothing is required to be saved. Let me say that again. Faith plus nothing is all that's required to be saved. What does the Bible say in Titus 3, 5? Not by works of righteousness. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us by regeneration, by the washing of, uh, by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's how we're saved. Not by works of righteousness. There's so many people who think, if I do this, do that, do something else, then I can be saved. No, we're saved through faith. In fact, it's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, is very, very clear on that. And that for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I believe firmly, and hope you believe that with me tonight, that faith plus nothing equals salvation. We just need to repent of our sin and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And God gives to us that wonderful gift of forgiveness of sin and eternal life. But let me say a second thing that I believe just as equally as, a, as that first statement, faith plus nothing equals salvation. And that is, I believe, secondly, faith works. Faith does work. Uh, James chapter 1, uh, James chapter 2, verses 17 and 20 says that, that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. In other words, faith works. Somebody said years ago that I picked up on a faith that hasn't changed your life hasn't saved your soul. A faith that hasn't changed your life hasn't saved your soul. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There is a change that God says takes place when we receive Christ as our Savior. But let me give you a third statement third that I believe. Number one, faith plus nothing equals salvation. Number two, faith works. Because we have faith, it generates something that shows evidence of, of something that's real, it's alive. But number three is that is this. Faith is incomplete without other essentials. Faith is incomplete without other essentials. You say, what essentials are you talking about? Verses five through seven. Verses five through seven it says, give all diligence, add to your faith, virtue. Add to your, your virtue, knowledge. And it goes down this list of things that we're to add. So let me uh, begin tonight 
by saying there is in this, in this subject, there's really God's part in your Christian life, and then there's your part in the Christian life. God's part is given to us in giving you a precious faith. Look at verse number one. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. They've obtained like precious faith. Who'd they obtain it from? God. God, God's part in our Christian life is to give me faith. God gave you faith. God gives every person that comes to him repenting of their sin, putting their faith and trust in Christ, God gives them that faith. To believe something that you can't see, something you can't touch, can't hold of, God gives that precious faith that you're seeing there in verse number one, that through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gives faith? Is it me? No. God gives me that faith. God gives you that faith. Uh, and then number two, what God's part in, Christ, in the Christian life is God makes you a partaker of his divine nature. Wow, what a provoking and what a, what a, what a, what a thought that is that God gives me a divine nature. That's what it says in verse uh, number four. Uh, it's in verse number four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Divine nature. When I think of the gospel, that the gospel is by which anybody's saved. Jesus died for my sins, buried, he rose again, he's a living savior. And if I believe that, that's the gospel, that's what saves me. But there are two parts to the gospel. Uh, that two parts is the fact that the cross that Jesus died on, that was God working for me. In other words, the cross is the fact that Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty and died in my place, paid the penalty for my sins. The second part of that is the Holy Spirit working in us. The cross working for us, the Holy Spirit of God working in us. And what a great teaching and truth that is in the Bible. Every Christian must realize that at, it was at the cross that God worked for me to work out my salvation. Nothing could I do. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to that cross I cling. And then realizing that when I'm saved, immediately God, the Holy Spirit, came to indwell in my body, in your body, the moment that you were saved. And that's what verse number four says. It's a promise that God has given to us that we have become partakers of his divine nature. God has, has uh, come to live in me. And so that is a, a part of every person that is born again by the Spirit of God. That's God's part. God's part is to give you faith. God's part is to give you his Holy Spirit to live within you, to give you the dynamic enable to, enabling you to live the Christian life, to live the Christian life through you by being filled with the Spirit of God, by allowing his fruit to fill your life. That's God's part. But then there's your part in the Christian life. Every Christian, verse number five, is to add to his faith. Did you get that, verse number five? And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to your faith. Every Christian is to add to his or her faith. Every Christian is to add to his or her faith with, what does the Bible say in verse five? All, what is this, what's the next word? Diligence. Add to your faith with all diligence. Are you getting that? You have to know the definition of the word diligence. Let me give you some synonyms for the word diligence. Adding to your faith with all diligence means with intensity. I used to coach basketball. I used to coach many sports. But in, in every sport that I coached, I wanted my athletes, my, the team that I was uh, coaching, I wanted them to demonstrate intensity. Nothing aggravated me more than just slovenly, slipshod kind of uh, effort given into the sport that we were, we were, I was coaching. I wanted intensity. That's the word in diligence. Giving intensity, 110%, everything that you've got, putting everything into it. That's the word diligence there. Put your energy into it. Put all your strength into it. All of this is something that is, 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 is said here, uh, and that 
uh, is said in, in verse number five, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So if we're going to be responsible to this, and my part is salvation, my part in the Christian life, God does his part. He gives faith. God does his part. He gives me his Holy Spirit. But my part is with that faith is I've got to add to my faith something else. What is that? I'm going to have to add, and he gives a list of things that I ought to add to my, to my uh, uh, Christian life. And he, uh, he gives the, all these words. Now watch what they are. Add to your faith virtue. And what is virtue? Virtue is character. Uh, uh, virtue is, is, is something that uh, is created in your life of, of godly character. Um, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but I use this with new Christians. I lead a person to Christ, for example, and he, he trusts Christ. He prays and says, I, I'm now a Christian. I've been forgiven of my sin. I'm on my way to heaven. I said, good. Now, this is, uh, let's say it's Thursday. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to read your Bible every day. Here's a passage of John. I want you to read this passage. Read your Bible on Thursday, or Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday, I want you to come to church with me. I want you to be in church this Sunday. He said, okay, good. I'll read my Bible, John. And I'll read those passages, and, and I'll be in church on Sunday. So I come Sunday, and I look for this fellow that I led to Christ. Lo and behold, he's not anywhere around. And so I go over to his house, knock, knock on the door, and say, hey, John, uh, did you read your Bible on, from Thursday? No, you know, I just didn't, uh, didn't get around to reading my Bible. Uh, you know, well, how come you didn't come to church uh, uh, today on Sunday? Well, I, stay, I, I, well, I was going to, but I stayed up late last night watching a movie and I just overslept. I just Let me ask you a question. Did that new Christian not love God, hate God, want to be rebellious against God because he didn't read his Bible? Because he didn't come to church? I said, no. It was a character issue. It was a virtue issue. He, just, he was just, it was the same reason his, his yard was full of weeds. The same reason his house, his house was all messy and unkept. It was because he was a little overweight, a little gluttony. It, was because, it wasn't because he hated God, was a rebel against God. They didn't read his Bible, didn't come to church. It was because he didn't have any character. It was a, a lack of virtue. So God says, add to your faith, vir you add to your faith virtue, character. And then he says, add your, uh, your virtue, knowledge. Knowledge is just how to live before God and how to live before others. And then he asks, says, add to your knowledge now, temperance, that's self-control. Proverbs uh, 16, 32 says that we're to control our spirit, and that's, that's something is our responsibility. Uh, then he says, add your, your temperance, patience. That's adding endurance, uh, being able to run the race with patience, Hebrews 12 says. And then he says, add your patience, godliness, godlikeness, uh, to be like Jesus, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. That, that's our responsibility to have reflect godliness in our life. And he says, add to that brotherly kindness. Now, that's family love. Of Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So, so be kind, brotherly kindness. And then add to that charity. Well, that's divine love, God's love. The fact is, 1 Corinthians 13 doesn't remind us there if we don't have charity, we're, we have nothing. Uh, that, that's basis. So here are a list of seven things God says to add to our Christian life. And I want you to notice the first on the list is what? Virtue. Virtue. God says, even before knowledge, I know some people that try to reverse it. You can't get knowledge. You can't find out. You're not going to have uh, knowledge, you're gonna, not even going to be able to get into the Bible with any regularity like that example I just gave you a moment ago, that new Christian that couldn't even read his Bible for a couple of days. Why? Not because he didn't love God. It was because he didn't have character. He didn't have self-discipline. He didn't have the character enough to discipline his schedule to get into the Bible. He didn't have character enough to go to bed at night on Saturday night to get up at a decent time and self-discipline himself to get to the house of God. Why? It wasn't his character. So I want to talk about that one thing tonight. We couldn't, I'm not going to talk about all seven things that we hear. And I could, like I said, I could spend a week on each of these other seven things, other six things, and the seven. But I want to show you how important virtue is. Why is virtue put before knowledge? Because if you don't have character, 
you won't be able to discipline yourself to get the knowledge and get to the patience and get to all the other things that God lists here. Character is virtually and vitally important in your life. Again, it's key as to why some are Christians are going forward in their life in RU and others are going backward or just staying neutral. It's a matter of character. Let's talk about character. Virtue is character. Add to your faith virtue. Becoming a Christian involves a, a will to develop change, a will to develop. I will change. That comes uh, when you're saved. You have a desire. You, you want to you want to change. You don't want to do the things that you used to do. You don't want to hang around with the people that you used to. The, that, there's a will inside of you that God gives you as a new creation in Jesus Christ of that divine nature, of the Holy Spirit of God convicting you, of telling you things shouldn't be the same as they were before you were saved. So uh, let me say something very important about that. You do not develop godly uh, character as a dose when you just get saved. That doesn't come automatically. Virtue does not come automatically the moment that you get saved. It's a victory, not a gift. In other words, a person that is unsaved, who is lazy before he's saved, is not going to become a worker after he gets saved automatically. It's not microwave Christianity. A person that, that is late before he's saved, is going to be late, unsa uh, late saved. A person that is a glutton before he's saved is going to be a glutton after he's saved. A person that is unorganized before he's saved is going to be unorganized after he's saved. It's all a matter of character. Well, let me give you just a, a list of things I put down here uh, on my notes here uh, of various character because virtue has many different facets. For example, uh, a person, uh, gratefulness, Gratitude, being thankful is character. You have to develop that character. Uh, Self-discipline is character. I put down uh, being neat is character. Uh, courage is character. Manners, being friendly, being trustworthy, uh, being responsible, being fair, virtue. A loyal, loyalty is a virtue. Helpful. A virtue. Optimism, optimistic, is a virtue. Punctuality, being on time, is, is character. Industriousness, being a worker, is character. How do you get that? You get that as a, as a habit, as a practice. You do it over and over and over again. I don't know if any of you remember the days of standard shifts, uh, stick shifts. I had a Mustang, a, a five-speed Mustang. Now that was on the floorboard, and, and that was started here, uh, clutch in, first gear, down to second gear, clutch in, clutch in, third gear, clutch in, third, uh, fourth gear, clutch in, fifth gear. Now, if you've ever taught somebody to use a, a, a stick shift or, or using a clutch, I mean, it's disaster to begin with because you got to remember how to put the clutch in, let it out, ease it out. you, you got to know when to shift and all of those kinds of things. But how do you, you know, after you do that over and over and over again, you do that in a, in a heartbeat. You don't even think about it. It's just something that comes by nature because you do it over and over and over again. The same thing is true in your Christian life. Bible reading. You don't even think about the fact is, do I read my Bible today? You do it every, you start doing it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the next week, the next month, you're doing it over and over again. Pretty soon it becomes part of your character. It becomes virtue. Church, Sunday morning, we used to say three to thrive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Three to thrive. That, you do that over and over again. I've been doing that for 70 years. Do you think I have to think about going to church? No, it's just habit. It's virtue. All of these things become virtue. You pick up your, th you pick up your, you pick up your things after you, after you put them down and uh, you hang things up. How do you, you practice doing that? It becomes part of your nature. Add to your faith virtue. Now let me say some comments and we'll be done. Uh, number one, uh, number one, no conflict is so severe as he who labors to, sub to subdue himself. 
That's what character, you're going to have a conflict of subduing yourself. When you become a new, new Christian, there are things that need to go out, there are things that need to come in, and there's no greater conflict and no greater battle that any Christian has than trying to subdue himself and change things. But you, ha you have to add to your faith. You've got to enter the conflict. Now, character is defined like this. Character is what you would do, what you would say if nobody else was looking. If nobody else had knew, what would you do? You see, there's a difference between character and reputation. Reputation is what people think you are. Character is what you really are. What you would do if nobody else knew about it, if nobody else could see, is really what you are. That's your character. And that character is, is what defines every one of us as Christians. Now, character is, is something that is demanded in the Christian life. You can't have a Christian life without character. It demands character. It demands virtue. You have to practice the right things over and over again. The goal of good character, the goal of every good character is to conquer appetites, things that I shouldn't have in my life, whether it's booze, whether it's drugs, whether it's uh, 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 manners, whether it's punctuality, whatever it is, whatever that God is trying to change in your life, good character, virtue, needs to be added to your life, and that's something that, that is to conquer those appetites in your life. Now, the test of your character is something that all of us ought to get a hold of. The test of your character is what takes to stop you. As you're listening to that, ask yourself this question. What causes me to stop reading my Bible? What causes me to stop going to church? What causes me to stop doing some habits that I've brought into my Christian life? What causes me to uh, hang out, uh, stop hanging out with the right kind of crowd and going with the wrong crowd? And I could go on and on and on as, as various applications are on. Those are the kinds of things that we need to uh, establish in our life. I need to develop strength of character. Now, let me close with this. There are three essentials to developing good virtue, adding to your virtue, good character to your faith. There are three things that are number one, backbone. You write that down, backbone. Strength of backbone. Number two, backbone. And number three, backbone. I want to ask you this question as we close tonight. What is it in your life, in your character, that is lacking? And I went over that whole list of courage, manners, uh, being friendly, trustworthy, loyal, fair, helpful, optimistic, punctual. What is it that is lacking? Don't sit there tonight and say, well, it's just no use. No, say with all diligence, with all my energy and all my strength, by the grace of God, I will add to my faith before everything else, virtue. I'm going to work on developing godly character. By the grace of God, God will help you. And you'll go forward in your Christian life. It won't be one of ups and downs and one like a, a roller coaster. You'll be growing in grace. And you can say, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. God bless you. Thank you for listening. And I hope that this will be a great help to you tonight. Add to your faith virtue.